Greetings, this is J.R. Dickey. Thanks for tuning in to our podcast. And by the way, don't forget our website, graceandtruth.net. I hope you're having a great day, but if not, hang with me. It's about to get better. Okay, today we're going to talk about some prophecies that Jesus gave us, and I'm hoping that every one of you will be a Berean. That means look to the Word yourself and check it out. See if this all makes sense to you after that. Okay, here we go. It was one of the saddest, most tragic things Jesus ever said, yet it is fantastically important for us today. He began by explaining to his disciples about how the word of his gospel would be spread and under which conditions it would be fruitful. Let's look at Matthew 13. It says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth, but they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. That's Matthew thirteen three through 8. Now later, Jesus explained, quote, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one, you know who that is, comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now, he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Again, that was from Matthew 13. Now, you're all probably familiar with this passage known as a parable of the sower. Seed, representing his word, is scattered here and there, and in some hearts it's stolen away. In some hearts it's received, but only superficially. In some it's choked out and ruined. And in some it's productive. To be clear, this is not just a truth for all time, but is also a prophetic picture. That is, a description of how the church got started. Jesus said to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And indeed they did. They spread seed everywhere. In less than a generation, the good news had spread to most of the civilized world, and in only three centuries, it was elevated to the proclaimed religion of the Roman Empire. Of course, this was historically a sad day, for this status led to a great compromise within the church. And that very situation brings us to the next part of Christ's series of prophetic parables. In Matthew 13, next, Following the parable of the sower, Jesus spoke of what the enemy of the kingdom would do in response to this growth. Quote, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain was sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Matthew thirteen twenty-four through 30 
Herein it is clear that the tares represent unbelievers and deceivers in the church. You see, just as young sprouts of tares resemble young sprouts of wheat, so phony Christians can be hard to discern from the sincere. Yet given time to mature, they both become quite evident and distinctive. And notice that this prophecy propels us forward all the way through the church age to the last days, the tribulation time. When Christ returns, the tares will be burned, and the wheat will be barned. Now, this is not speaking of the rapture, for that is when the bride of Christ, the assembly of honest believers still on earth, is taken up and brought along with the resurrected faithful, also part of the bride, into the presence of the Lord. In the rapture, the wheat is separated first rather than the tares, so this parable is pointing to the second coming of Christ to earth, which will happen at the end or the conclusion of the tribulation. So then, having moved us forward from the initial spreading of the word and the consequent sowing of the enemy's tares into the final days of the age, Jesus next describes the unnatural nature of the last day's kingdom of God on earth with the story of the mustard seed. Again from Matthew 13, It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. That's Matthew 13, 31 and 32. Now, in another parable, Jesus used the mustard seed as a picture of faith. Matthew 17, 20. And indeed, the church began in faith. You see, the mustard seed is small and will naturally grow into a modest herbal plant. But, Jesus said, this kingdom would grow unnaturally large with branches that would be big enough for birds to perch upon, presumably to nest as well. So what's the big deal? Of course, this is a well-known passage, and many of you already know that as with the fowl of Christ's previous parable, the sower, Birds there represent the agents of Satan. So this is a pretty scary and sobering truth. The final state of the church is that of being filled with evil agents. They're in its branches. And that brings us to the tragically sad prophetic proclamation we first mentioned. Here it is, Matthew 13, 33 and 34. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till it was all leavened. For those of you familiar with the meanings of prophetic imagery in Scripture, this passage has some recognizable elements. We know from John 6, 31-35, and other scriptures, that bread or meal is symbolic of teaching or doctrine, while leaven is always a picture of sin or sin-filled doctrine. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 6 and 12, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And in the following verses it was said of his disciples, Then they understood that he did not tell them beware of the leaven or literal bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In this last parable, a woman is mixing leaven in specifically three measures of meal or flour. This is arresting because, again, Christ is speaking of the church, and from the chronological order derived from the sequence of parables, it's the last day's condition of the church. So, who is this woman, and what do the three measures of meal picture? Hmm, Because this is a prophetic parable, it's quite clear that this woman is not a specific person or historical figure. She pictures a spiritual force that is corrupting the doctrine of the church with sin and its close cousin, deception. The Bible says concerning the last days, in 2 Timothy 3.13, evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, as we let the Bible interpret itself, we refer to Revelation 17, where we see another prophetic woman riding a beast. It is said of her, quote, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand 
a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That's in Revelation 17, 4-6. This woman, known as the great whore, pictures the false religious system that deceives the whole world. Now, I refer you to our letter, our lesson, entitled Pious Prostitution, which you can download from our website, graceandtruth.net. For a more in-depth study on this, I suggest that she and the woman mixing leaven in Christ's parable may be one in the same, or at least of the same spirit. And as we continue to consider the book of Revelation, we see in chapters 2 and 3 that there are indeed four churches out of the seven mentioned those in those two chapters, which will be active at the end of the church age. Refer to our letters, our lessons, Fire Eyes, The Heating Never Halts, and Victory. Again, you can download those freely from our website, graceandtruth.net, and you can see more on these churches there. These four are Thyatira, representing the Roman Catholic Church system, Sardis, representing the mainline Protestant denominational church, and Philadelphia, representing the weak but faithful believers whose beginnings are associated with genuine moves of the Holy Spirit beginning in the 1800s onward, and finally Laodicea, representing the last days self-absorbed or narcissistic church system whose congregants carry many Christian-like names but fundamentally are not Christ-centered. In Revelation, only one of these four is commended by Christ for holding on to the veracity of his word. That's Philadelphia. And this is the one group that Jesus promises to guard or keep from the hour of temptation or testing. That's the tribulation time, which he says shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. You see Revelation 3, verse 10 for that. For that reason, we are confident that the Philadelphian believers will indeed be raptured before the wrath of God is poured out. But that leaves three behind, remaining three churches or church systems who, like the three measures of meal in Christ's parable, have gotten their meal or doctrine mixed with leaven or sin. The entire church left behind at the rapture will then be a corrupt and corrupting entity. Its doctrine will be filled with with sinful error, and its branches filled with Satan's agents, the birds. It's a horrible, sickening truth. But unlike the rapture, which will occur in a blink of an eye, the infestation of the birds and the mixing of the leaven both take time, and I'm firmly convinced have been going on for quite a while already. The contemporary church as a whole is filled with squawking, filthy fowl, and rotting worldly doctrines, dressed up to look and sound very Christian, very open-minded and sensible. Therefore, if you think of yourself as a Philadelphian believer, your guide and guard is the unaltered, unembellished Word of God. The one world religion of the last days will be the result of leaven in the meal and birds in the branches and will be very ecumenical. There will be an increasing equality among the faiths of the whole world, and even a mixing. Take Christianity, add a bit of Islam, throw in some Buddhism and Mormonism, and even ancient Judaism. You get my drift. And that is indeed happening even now. The birds are squawking, and the heaven is rotting. And it's time indeed for sincere believers to stand up against it radically or get out of it entirely. Now may the Lord grant you peace and discernment in the midst of any storm and faith to trust Him. Look for our next podcast. May you realize, my friends, more of His grace today.